So I thought I'd talk a little bit about harmonic motion just to give a better understanding of it and what exactly does it look like, how is it best to picture it, what is meant by angular frequency, which is in radians per second, versus frequency that we're familiar with, which is in hertz, uh, and why can we write it in different ways. So the idea is we got an equation, something like, uh, let me write a script x, x of t equals c1 times cosine omega t plus c2 times sine of omega t. And I think that the best way to view this is to imagine a disk. Let me draw it here. And this disk has some sort of an angular velocity that we call omega equals angular velocity or also called the angular frequency. I like to think of it as a velocity, but radians per second. And that's the speed at which this disk is spinning. Now, what we can do is, let me just draw some lines here. One there, one there, and then one down the middle. And we'll make that black. Oops. One more time. Okay. And let's just imagine the cosine graph for a second. Imagine we have an arrow that initially is pointing straight up. And as this disk spins, the arrow is going to move to in a position omega t, uh, or wherever it was plus omega t. In other words, it's going to rotate by an amount omega times t. Initially, it was up here. At time omega t, it's, say, over here. Eventually, it will get to this position. Oh, didn't draw that very well. At which point, it would be down here at zero. Right? Where all I've done is I've taken a line going across in each case. Okay, and just to clean this up a bit, I'm actually going to remove this. But the red line represents the cosine curve. In fact, let's just write this up, up top here. Cosine omega t. In fact, it's C1 times cosine omega t where this would be C1 and minus C1. Okay, and let me just give some points here. So at some t it starts off at 1, it eventually goes to 0, then goes down to minus 1. This is not the most perfect sine cosine curve you've ever seen, but it will serve the purpose. I can do better than that, I'm sure. One more try. I'm sorry, my graphing with this is not the best. Okay. Something like that. All right. Similarly, I can draw the sine portion of that. As I'm making a mess here. This would be C2 sine omega t. That, of course, starts at zero, and as this rotates to this position, it would then be at one, which would be, say, over here. Then it comes down to zero. Then it comes to minus one, etc. So if I want to chart that, I'm just going to clean this up again. Um, let me put my dots back. This would look something like, oh, that's a better curve. All right, and what we could say is, at a certain sense, that the cosine graph leads the sine graph by 90 degrees, this angle being 90 degrees. In other words, the cosine vector, if you want to call it that, is always ahead of the sine vector, bearing in mind rotation is counterclockwise. We say that cosine leads the sine graph. And in this case, I've actually just said that C1 equals C2, the way I've drawn it graphically, but it doesn't have to be like that. All right, so what we could do is actually find the resultant vector here, which would do something like this. All right, where um, 
let me just put some labels here. The length of this vector is C2. The length of the top is also C2. The length of this is C1, and the length of this is C1. And again, in this case, C1 is equal to C2, but it doesn't have to be that way. Um, my drawing skills are unfortunately not good enough to do something else. And the resultant I'll draw in green would look something like this. Okay, so we could write the harmonic motion in terms of a C1 cosine omega t and C2 sine omega t, or we could write it in terms of this vector here. And that vector we can see leads the cosine graph by an amount we'll call theta. And it trails, excuse me, leads the sine graph by theta, and it trails the cosine graph by an amount that we'll call, we'll call it phi. The magnitude of this vector in green we'll just call uppercase X. Okay. Now, if we go ahead and we draw the circle that the green vector is moving along, and let me just see if I can draw this fairly accurately. I'll change color for this. All right, good enough. So this outer circle is the circle along which X will move, the green vector. And obviously, initially, the green vector is right here. It's at a height C1. We can see that. But eventually, it's going to move to this position here. And if I draw those lines across, uh, we don't want it in green. Let's pick a better color, lighter one. OK. Now what will happen, and, and we can see that in the case of this drawing, because C1 is equal to C2, that x is exactly in between the sine and cosine graph. So it will meet, reach a maximum here. Um, it will reach zero here in between the two. It will reach a maximum down there below, or minimum, I should say. And if I draw it, it would look something like, like that. That's the resultant of adding C1 sine and C2 cosine, where C1 is equal to C2. Got it? So now, if we have a look at this green graph, we, we see, well, we see a couple of things. First of all, going back to the original equation, which we'll call equation 1, I can also write x of t as capital X times cos, and let me write it out and then explain it, omega t minus phi. So x of t, which is just this vector now, I can write it as the magnitude, capital X, and since we want harmonic motion, I can either write it in terms of the cosine or the sine function. In this case, I'm going to write it in terms of the cosine, and I see that it lags the cosine function by an amount phi. So I can write it as x times cosine omega t minus phi, which is known as the phase difference. The phase difference between the cosine function and the resultant vector, which I'll call x, the green vector. Okay. I could also write this, I'm still in black, as x, it would be the same x times sine, but in this case it would be omega t plus theta. You see that? Because here's sine omega t, this vector, and it's shifted by an amount theta, shifted in terms of its phase or angular frequency. Okay. And it should be fairly uh, obvious to see by inspection that x, the magnitude, by Pythagoras is equal to the square root of c1 squared plus c2 squared. And phi is equal to the arctangent, tan tangent inverse, of, we can see it here, c2 divided by c1 is tangent of phi. So phi is the arctangent of c2 divided by c1. And similarly, if we wanted to write it in terms of theta, we could say that that's the arctangent of theta, the arctangent of c1 divided by c2. All right, so just again to recap very quickly, what I did is I showed you
that you can think of harmonic motion as a disk spinning at an angular velocity omega. Uh, we've got the sine and cosine, sine in blue and cosine in red, and I showed you how those track in co according to this plot, where we can plot the, the output of the function by looking at the, the y value, for lack of a better word, if this is y axis. Um, this axis, of course, is omega t, which is the x-axis. Um, and we can write it in terms of a resulting vector x, which lags the cosine function by an amount phi or leads the sine function by an amount theta. And sometimes it's more useful to write it in the form of equation 1 with sines and cosines. I generally prefer that, but a lot of times it's easier to write it in terms of just a single function with a phase shift. I should also point out in, and we'll call this equation 2 and 3 for reference, in equation 1 we have two unknowns, C1 and C2, whereas in equations 2 and 3 our unknowns are x and phi or x and theta respectively. And then I've shown you how you can convert your C1s and C2s into your x's, phi's and theta. Now for those of you who uh, one other thing, I was just right, um, you can see from this disk that um, the frequency is equal to uh, omega divided by 2 pi. Well, another way I can write it is that omega equals 2 pi f. So the frequency of hertz is actually how many times a second this disk is spinning, how many times it's completing a full revolution. And for each revolution, they're 2 pi radians. And so we can convert between revolutions per second, which is the frequency, and the angular frequency, which, as I said, I prefer to think of as an angular velocity. But that's what we mean by an angular velocity, which confused me for the longest time. But the reason that this is an angular velocity is it speaks to the speed at which this vector is rotating around the circle. So I hope that helps clarify things. <laughs> For those of you who prefer a mathematical explanation, um, this can be done as follows by recognizing from the diagram that C1 can be written as x times cosine phi, and C2 can be written as x sine phi. C2 is x sine phi, C1 is x cosine phi. Similarly, I could also write it in terms of theta as c1 is equal to x times sine theta. c1 is x times sine of theta. And c2 would then be x cosine of theta. Let me give these some numbers. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And I'll continue this on the next page. What I've done is gone ahead and copied equation 1 and also 7, 8, 9, and 10. And we proceed here by substituting, in the first case, equation 7 and 8 into 1. So let me write that. Substitute... 7 and 8 into 1. And um, what that should give us is that simply x of t is equal to x cosine phi, let me do in brackets, times cosine omega t plus C2, which is sine phi, since I've taken the x out, times sine omega t. And we'll call this equation 11. But this is just a trig identity. So let me write that. Trig identity. Okay. Cosine phi times cosine omega t plus sine of phi times sine omega t is simply equal to x times 
cosine of omega t minus phi. Straight out of a trig identity, and this is equation 12, which is kind of what we showed graphically on the previous page. All right, and then to find uh, phi and um, x in terms of c1 and c2, I can do the following. If I take equation 7 and 8, so from 7 and 8, I can write that c1 squared plus c2 squared, take the square root of this, that's equal to x squared into cosine squared of phi plus sine squared of phi square root. But this is just equal to 1. That's also trig identity, right? That's equal to 1. And so the answer is just x. So this implies that x is equal to the square root of c1 squared plus c2 squared, as we found on the previous page. So the math works. And similarly, what we can also do is take c2 divided by c1, which would equal the x's cancel. It would equal to sine phi divided by cosine of phi, which is equal to tangent of phi. This implies that phi is equal to the inverse tangent or arctangent of C2 divided by C1. All right. I'm not going to do it here. I'll leave it as an exercise to you. But if you want to get it in terms of, instead of cosine omega t minus phi, you now want it in terms of sine omega t plus theta, uh, you would substitute, this case, 9 and 10 into 1. And you'll find when you do that, you get something similar to this, slightly different. But that's also a trig identity that is equal to sine omega t. Excuse me, it's not phi in this case. It's theta. Oops, I'm making a mess here. So this should be omega t plus theta. Excuse me for that. And you'll go through the same idea here as you, we did previously. I'll leave that as an exercise to you. Anyway, I hope you found this video useful. Uh, if you did, please go ahead and give us a thumbs up so that others can get to see it, or leave us a comment in the section below. Or better still, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. You'll be notified of all future videos. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll catch up with you in the next video.